Hello, hello, my lovelies. Welcome back. So now that we've had a brief view at statistical tables and then we've buzzed on over and seen a bit of geometry, now we're going to dig into the weird stuff. Probability. For me, this is the weird stuff. Oftentimes, I kind of double check myself on this. So two of the fancy words that we're going to see used throughout these sections are outcomes and event. Outcomes are the most basic possible results of observations or experiments. For example, if you toss two coins, one possible outcome is HT and another possible outcome is TH or heads, tails or tails, heads. An event consisting of one or more outcomes that share a property of interest. That's an event. For example, if you toss two coins and count the number of heads, the outcomes HT and TH are both going to represent the same event of one head and coincidentally one tail. So the event doesn't have to be only one of the outcomes. It could be that we want to know the probability of several outcomes just within a certain category. So like be on the lookout for that just because we name it doesn't mean it has to be a single outcome of whatever experiment or observations we're looking at. So when we write P parentheses, and then we're going to write in words like the probability that the role is greater than four. That probability is always a fraction between zero and one. So the bottom is always larger than the top number in this fraction, or it's a decimal that has a zero in front of the decimal not a one or a negative one. It's always zero point something. Like we can see down here, 0 0.5 in the center is our 50-50 chance. Just like we get with a fair coin, flip heads, flip tails. Now a probability zero event means something is impossible. And a probability one event is something that is absolutely certain. So if I'm rolling a normal six-sided dice with, you know, the pips one through six, the probability of rolling a number higher than zero is one. All the outcomes are higher than zero, so it is certain I will do that. Likewise, a probability zero is rolling a number higher than six. Six is not higher than six, so that would have to be seven, and a normal die doesn't have seven. So that would be a probability zero. I was going to think of something ridiculous, but those are actually like mathematical events. We very often roll dice. If I don't specify, or more to the point, if Alex does not specify when you're reading a problem, it usually does, um, and it talks about a die or dice, think of the normal six-sided, numbered, one, two, three, four, five, six, just like you'd use at the craps table, basically, or, you know, any board game. Unless you're weird like me, in which case dice is way too broad a term. So stick with the D6s. Okay, so there are three basic, te basic techniques for finding probability. There's the theoretical method that mathematicians love, the empirical method that mathy mathematicians are kind of e about, and statisticians are like, yes, because you actually use real numbers. And the subjected method. This is your gut instinct on things. So based on everything you've seen in your life or looking at the sky, you think there's a 60% chance that we're going to get rain. Something like that. That's what the subjective idea is. So theoretically, though, is in a perfect world, if I'm flipping a coin, what should happen? So in math land, as it were. So with the theoretical method, we assume the behavior is fair. For example, when we say the probability of a coin toss is 50% heads or 50% tails, we assume the coin is equally likely to land on heads or tails. Thus, this probability is based on a theory of how the coin behaves. So sometimes we will come up with what the theoretical probabilities are, and then we'll have some results and we might ask, do these results make sense? Like, 
you know, if I see something radically skewed where if I did 50 tosses and like 40 of them were heads, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting towards questionable. If I did like a thousand and 800 were heads, then it's, it, no, this is not a fair coin. It should not be that far off of the halfway mark. So we can actually kind of interact the two. The theoretical tells us if we assume everything's fair and then we observe and find an empirical probability and then compare the two. Now there's fancy math formulas for making those comparisons that you use statistical wibbly wobbly smushy stuff. We're not going to get that far into it. Like if you need statistics that hardcore, you hire a statistician. Okay, so find all the possible outcomes and events of tossing two coins. Okay, event is like too broad. I could write a number of ridiculous events, but we'll take a look at the different ways we might see events, like standard events, if you will. So the possible outcomes, I'm flipping my coin and the choice for the first flip, it either lands head up or tail up. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to label these. That's toss one. We could get heads or tails. And then when we do this kind of out, outcome diagram, like we do a branching structure to connect things because at the end, we usually just represent it by a string of letters. So that's how we're going to show it. And then let's change colors. Toss number two, likewise, same thing. It could be heads or tails. So for each of these, now we get heads or tails and heads or tails. And this is like a slow down version of the multiplication principle, which you should be getting a little more practice in at some point in 1300. Um, and I'm gonna post a video on that in the next day or two, I hope as well, because I have a 1300 class. All right. So now we're just going to follow the branches of the tree diagram and write down every possibility. So if I follow all the top branches, I go up to heads and then I go up to heads again. So there is one of my outcomes. And it's very common to just write HH like that. Likewise, I go up, but then I could have gone down. So heads, tails. And the order here is important. I'm saying the first flip was heads and the second flip was tails. Now I've done all of my heads branches and you can, like if you're drawing this, you can kind of like highlight it once you've written it down. You can also though, if you just count the end of the branches, you can see how many outcomes you get. In this case, it's four. So you know you're done when you have a list of four outcomes. So we've done two for the heads. Now we should see two for the tails and we do tails first, head second and double tails. So most of the time when we talk about coin flips and probabilities and the events, we'll usually say something like, what's the probability that I will get two heads? Or what's the probability I will get zero heads? Or what's the probability I will get exactly one head? So each of those events, that's one way to describe it. I could also describe all of those saying tails instead of heads. And they kind of correspond differently because if I got two heads, then there were no tails. But that's one of the ways we could list the events here. I'll go ahead and type that. So events, we could have zero heads, one head, or two heads. And I'm gonna zoom back in over here and I'm gonna add in the word exactly. Later on in the videos, we're going to talk about at least one. So that could mean one or two or three or four, however many. But when we talk about just static events, usually we're gonna talk about it like this, where it's exactly one, exactly two. So the probability of zero heads is double tails. That happened one time out of four outcomes. Assuming a fair coin, 
we would weight those outcomes equally. So it's a one out of four probability, 25% chance of getting double tails with two coin flips. Like that's the kind of idea we're talking about. So the theoretical method for equally likely outcomes, count the total number of possible outcomes, which we did, there were four. Among all the possible outcomes, count the number of ways the event of interest A can occur. And I did, that no heads was two tails and that only happened one time. Determine the probability P of A from the number of ways A can occur over the total number of possible outcomes. This is very often where that part whole idea of fractions comes into play because with probabilities, it's the part you wanna count over the whole number of ways you can do something. So just saying that's not a horrible conception to have, but I'd really like what I want over the total. Like those ideas I think function better. Now this does depend on that equally likely outcomes. If I didn't care about the order that I was flipping the coins in, then heads, tails, and tails, heads might count as the same event, but it happens like the same outcome, but it would happen twice as often as the other two. So that would not be equally likely outcomes. So just to kind of like put that into comparison here, I've got every possible thing with my order taken into account. And the tree diagram kind of guarantees I've done that in a very strategic fashion, very logical, so I know I've got all the things. So multiplication principle says, I take the possible outcomes of one event, of one thing rather, and then the possible outcomes of the next thing. And I multiply those two together. That's how to figure out how many end branches on a tree diagram like this you'll have. So this would be two times two is four. So if I toss three, toss a to coin three times, I would multiply two times two times two and I would get eight possible outcomes. And likewise, if it was four coin flips, dear God, why, but four coin flips, two times two times two times two is 16. That gets a little too big for tests and whatnot. Usually we'll stick with two or three coin flips. One is a little too boring. All right. Another one we like is cards. Like is a relative term here, but I copied this from Alex. So this is a diagram that tells you like what every card in a deck of cards looks like. I'm going over this because sometimes I run across students who have never seen a deck of cards. It happens. Some parents are very strict and you never get to see cards. Um, other times it's just lack of exposure. You never know what anybody was doing in their past. So I have this here. By all means, copy this off of the completed notes to put in your formula sheet if if this is something that would help you to see it, to have it. If you're more familiar with your cards, you don't have to. I played with a lot of spades back in the day and on my phone, so I'm very comfortable with my cards. All right. So here we have a description. There are 52 cards in the deck. Now here's what I call my card numbers. There's four suits and each suit has the same number of cards. So 52 divided by four is 13. There are 13 cards in a suit, ace through 10, and then three more for jack, queen, king. So hearts and diamonds are called red suits. Spades and clubs are called black suits. Okay, so there are 26 red and 26 black. That's what half of 52 is. If you draw one card from a standard deck, what is the probability that it will be a spade? All right, so remember our formula, the probability of what I want. So let's go ahead and write a little. So the probability of getting a spade. So 
So how many spades are there? That's what goes on top. And there are 13. 1 through 10, 11, 12, 13. Over how many total possible outcomes are there? I'm just going to pull one card. So there are 52 cards there. It could be one of those 52. So the 52 is the total. And there are 13 that satisfy the thing I'm talking about. There are 13 spades. So that is our probability. And then that actually nicely reduces because remember I said equal numbers in the suits. You can kind of see, oh, the spades are one fourth of the deck. And that's what 13 over 52 reduces to. All right, now what's the probability of drawing a red card? Okay, so those are the hearts and the diamonds. And note, they put the color here. So just in case, not only are you not familiar with cards, but you're also colorblind or it's just been a while, whatever colors there as well. And then there's that gray box over the jacks, queens, and kings. When we talk about face cards, at least when Alex talks about face cards, it is only referring to those three, jacks, queens, and kings. So the aces are not counting as face cards. In some games they do, so that's why I'm kind of making that point, depending on the games y'all play. So probability drawn a red card. So the probability of red. So there are two suits, two times 13 is 26 out of the 52 total. But you can also see that is half of the deck, which is what 26 over 52 reduces to. Now the probability of drawing a jack is a little more interesting because there's fewer of them. And there are only four jacks, jack of hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. Nothing else in here is called a jack. And when we're dealing in math land, there are no jokers. So these are jacks, the dudes with heads, not jokers, the thing with the bicycle if you're using a standard bicycle deck. So here, 52 has four suits. Each suit has 13 cards. So 52 divided by four is 13. So this reduces to one out of 13. Let me just doodle that in because 52 is four times 13. The fours would cancel. The four on top cancels to a one. The bottom just leaves the 13. The reason we like cards though, is it lets us look at some of the more complex probabilities that we're gonna see in the next section where we can talk about two things occurring at the same time or one or the other. So we're gonna kind of bring back in our ands and our ors from the logic section we just did. Just like the overall meaning, not the actual truth tables. So just remember, and has to be both to be true for probabilities, that means it must meet both requirements. And then the or, one or the other works. And then we're going to have to worry about double counting. It's not that bad, though. It actually works out really nicely. You select a person at random at a large conference group. What is the probability that the person has a birthday in July? And then they give us the lovely assumed 365 days out of the year, meaning we're not playing with a leap year. So of those 365 days, the probability of a July birthday. So July is January, February, March, April, May, June, July. It's a 31 month. So 31 over 365, let's go ahead and type that and see what uh, the program tells me. So 0 0.0849, all right. Now just for comparison's sake, 0 0.083333 is 1 12th. So very close to 1 12th, which is what we roughly assume, 12 months, one of them is July. It is just a little bit different though because July has is one of the months with a bunch of days. All right. Now, when we determine a probability based on observations or experiments, we use the empirical method. 
this probability is based on observations instead of theoretical ideas. The empirical method is sometimes referred to as the relative frequency method. Ooh, fancy words. This one is, I don't have a theoretical model, but I want to talk about the probability. So I'm going to make a bunch of observations, see what happens, and then from that data, I'll make a prediction. So a good example of this is like sports statistics, and no, I'm not very good at them, but the idea is we see how a player is doing over time, and then we can make a prediction about what their future behavior is based on how they've done like so far in a season, barring some wacky out of place event. You know, when a player gets injured, well, obviously I'm not going to predict they're going to do good because I know they're on the bench. But if they're not benched, then you can make a prediction. I did a little statistics project on it. I'm still mad at Kawhi. We would have won. Or at least we would have done better. Anyway, go Spruce go. Geological records indicate that the river has crested above a particular high flood level just four times in the past 2,000 years. Wow. What is the empirical probability that the river will crest above this flood level next year? So the event we're talking about, so the probability that it's going to crest happened only four times out of 2,000 years. That is insane. So that is 0 0.002, which is tens, hundreds, thousands, two thousandths of a chance that it's going to flood this year. Except in San Antonio, then the chances are much higher because it always floods. Even if you think it won't, it will. And that would reduce fraction wise, four goes into 2,500 times. So it is also the fraction one over 500. Sorry, there was supposed to be an equals in there. I personally would take either answer. Um, I would be careful about converting when you have little tiny decimals like that to percentages. I just leave it, the probability is decimal, done. But that means, it's very tiny, which our gut agrees with. If it only happened four times in 2,000 years, yeah, it's not going to happen. Empirical coin tossing. Suppose you toss two coins 100 times and your results are as follows. No heads occurred 22 times. One head occurred 51 times. And two heads occurred 27 times. Mm, not bad. So based on that, we can calculate the empirical probability. So if they didn't tell me the total, I could add each of the three categories and get the total number of times I performed the experiment, in this case, flipping two coins. But they told us there's 100. So now, if I was going to calculate the empirical probability for no heads, it would be 22 out of 100, which calculates to the nice 0 0.22. Then the next one is 51 out of 100, 0.51. And then the next one, 27 out of 100, 0.27. Now the actual percentages, remember we had four outcomes, four events, no heads was one of the four. So our theoretical here, would be 0.25, let's put a zero there. And then for the one head, that was heads, tails, or tails, heads, two out of four times, which is 0 0.5 or 0 0.50. I'll go ahead and put the other zero. And then likewise, the two heads is going to be just like the no heads. There's only one possible way to get that, so it happens one fourth of the time. So here, the experiment is really close to the theoretical numbers we got there. 
Now, one of the questions that the homework is going to kind of get you to thinking towards is, what if I only did it 10 times or we'll say 20, so it's divisible by four. You know, would I expect my results to be very close or would it make sense that it might be a little skewed? Like, you know, maybe I just didn't get a lot of heads when I was flipping. So maybe I have more zero heads and less of the one head and two heads. 20 is not a lot of experiments. It's a lot of work, but in probability world, it's not that much. A hundred is a better, but really we want more than that. We like big numbers. We will talk more about that. All right, I'm gonna pause to do the next video.